like to start by introducing our, our panelists. Uh, Fred Maniak is the uh, Washington news editor for the Associated Press. Uh, he was a National Press Foundation fellow in Shanghai. Uh, he, in his current position, he manages a team of uh, reporters that cover trade policy, the Federal Reserve, the global economy. Um, Jason Lang, in the middle here, has uh, been writing about the U.S. economy since he joined Reuters Washington Bureau in 2011. Uh, he writes about the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, U.S. elections, economic indicators. Um, and then we have uh, James Freeman here to my right. He's the assistant editor of the Wall Street Journal editorial page. He's the author of the Best of the Web column, and he's a uh, contributor to Fox News. And Robin Wigglesworth at the end uh, is the U.S. markets editor for the Financial Times. He's in charge of the S FT's coverage of financial markets uh, throughout Americas. So we're all delighted. I think I speak on, on all of our behalf to have you gentlemen here with us today at Columbia. Um, today's discussion, we're going to focus on the way that government and media relate and how that's been changing. So the world feels pretty different now. Uh, communications take, take different forms with, with new technologies, with different content and style. And the questions that, that we're going to be talking about are how has government communication been changing? How has the media response to that and the market's response to that been changing? And what's the importance of all, all this change? So um, I'd like uh, to start with Fred. Uh, you oversee a team of reporters who report on, on the Fed, yes. uh, the Federal Reserve, and, and their communications. Um, what kind of changes have you seen in the past year since we've uh, had a new Fed chairman, Jerome Powell? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'd, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the challenges that those of us who cover the Fed or, or watch the Fed um, are facing, which are probably increasing given the increased visibility of the Fed, of Fed officials, the increasing communications they're trying to make, uh, and the difficulty that some of us have assessing what, it, what all of it means. Um, but also, I'd like to talk just a, a couple of minutes about the difficulty that the Fed itself has uh, gauging what reaction its own statements and actions will have in, in the markets. Um, so let me take it uh, back to um, uh, an incident a few, uh, few months ago. It was the December 19th Fed meeting. Uh, you'll recall this was the day that the Fed announced its fourth and final rate hike of 2018. Uh, they also uh, uh, issued their updated economic forecast and uh, suggested that they would rate, raise rates only uh, twice in 2019 rather than three times under their previous forecast. Um, and the statement was pretty much pro forma. Uh, and all of us who cover the Fed or oversee uh, Fed coverage came into this meeting pretty much knowing what we were going to hear. We were going to hear uh, a fairly balanced view of the economy, the global economy <clears throat> slowing, there's a trade war. You know, things are not great, but they're not terrible either. The U.S. economy is still pretty, pretty solid. Uh, so they'll pull back a little bit on the rate, rate hikes, but not too much. Um, and that's kind of what we got in the statement, and that's kind of what we got in Jerome Powell's news conference uh, after that. Um, and so most of us who went into that coverage were looking for what we got, and we wrote our, our news stories based on what we expected. That was kind of our bias. And an interesting thing happened during the Powell press conference. The market began tumbling and then accelerating. And those of us who were writing stories or editing stories on this were trying to figure out what, what had happened. I mean, we basically got what we thought we were going to get, you know, a sort of balanced view of the economy, a pullback in the, in the forecast for tightening for 2019. Powell sounded, you know, so-so about the economy. But the market was tumbling. And if you look at the news coverage of that day's uh, meeting and press conference, there doesn't seem to be anything that would have freaked the market out. You know. The Federal Reserve raised rates for a fourth time, and they, you know, they see a slower uh, rate hike schedule for next year, and, and the economy is, is okay, you know, although global pressures are increasing. Um, what we missed was something the markets did not miss that day. So who, there were two words that Powell uttered, and nobody in the news conference, none of the, none of the reporters really followed up on it and, and sort of hit on it. Who remembers what those two words were? Automatic pilot. Automatic pilot. Powell was referring to the runoff from the balance sheet, which, of course, has the effect of putting upward pressure on rates. And so he said, 
we see our, our, uh, our balance sheet runoff basically being on automatic pilot, you know, going forward. And the market kind of, you know, didn't like that. And it made it clear, not only that day, but in the days that followed, between that day and I think like Christmas Eve, the market just continued falling. And then they kind of leveled off after Christmas. Um, and ba basically, we all sort of caught up to what the market was reacting to. You know, if you look at the coverage of the days that followed the meeting, it, it kind of was clear that this balance sheet reference, which no one was kind of expecting and no one really, you know, spotted when he said it, had really caused the market to fall. And the market had picked up on it, unlike most of us who oversee the Fed coverage. And then what happened? January 3rd, Jay Powell speaking at the American Economic Association meeting in Atlanta, and he suddenly made a fairly sharp pivot in his tone. Suddenly he was talking, emphasizing patience, emphasizing data dependence, and importantly, he said, if we came to the view that the balance sheet normalization on any, uh, or any other as aspect of normalization was part of the problem, we wouldn't hesitate to make a change. Well, that's not the same thing as automatic pilot, right? So what had changed between the December 19th meeting and the January 3rd interview or he had with a reporter in Atlanta on January 3rd? Nothing really. I mean, you know, the global economy continued to show signs of weakness, but not dramatically worse than it had before that. It seems observationally that what had happened was this market tumble between started in a little before the meeting, but it certainly accelerated after the meeting. Between then and his appearance in Atlanta, the market, and of course he didn't say that, but it, it seems to us, looking back at it, that you know, in, in echoing the, disc, the, uh, the uh, paper that one of the previous speakers mentioned, the idea of a Fed put certainly raises, it, raises itself in, in, an, in an example like that. Um, it also suggests that Jay Powell is not perfect, not surprisingly, at anticipating the impact of his statements, or even even an offhanded statement, uh, uh, comment, not not the, the FOMC statement itself, but just his comments in a news conference on the markets. And clearly, you know, it seems it seems observationally, it seems that this concerned him and the, and the other Fed members. And as so, after January third, you started to see an increasing <clears throat> emphasis by him and others on the Fed on data dependence, on patience, wait and see. You know, all of this stuff is these reassuring, dovish, you know, words and tones. And, but if you look back economically, there really wasn't much that had changed, you know, in, in terms of the global picture between, but between, between the December 19th meeting and everything that has happened since then. So, and of course, he's in, since uh, in the last few weeks, he's even gone as far as to say, uh, we're going to, uh, end the, uh, look to end the runoff before the end of the year. And there was even a, re a reference he made to the possibility that they might even go back to doing quantitative easing as opposed to the quantitative tightening that they have been doing with the, with the runoff from the balance sheet. So um, if you ask Jay Powell, he'd probably say, no, there's no Fed put. No, we, the Fed doesn't react to the markets. But it's hard to believe otherwise. Um, so anyway, the, the takeaway that I get from this are, 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 are basically First of all, how difficult it is for those of us in the media to, in real time, cover what the sort of news is out of a Fed meeting and, what, and certainly what the impact will be on the markets. B, how much faster the markets is compared to the news media in picking up what's new or what's significant in a, in even, even in a seemingly <clears throat> offhanded comment by the Fed chairman. But also, thirdly, I think I would just say if there is, in fact, a Fed put that we have been witnessing in real time these past few mo couple of months, I mean, is that a healthy thing? Is that a healthy thing for the economy? Is that a healthy thing for the financial markets themselves? I mean, there was a reference to a former Fed governor saying, you know, is the Fed data dependent or is it asset price dependent? And I think that's an interesting question, and it's potentially a troubling one if, if the Fed is, in fact, unduly wedded to the market reaction. Jason, as somebody who's part of the uh, Reuters economic team, you're charged every day with trying to uh, discern, uh, read the tea leaves, and figure out what this Federal Reserve communication means. Um, what do you see happening? Is it the Federal Reserve that's communicating differently? Are the markets responding differently to the same sorts of communications, or is it some of each? Uh, well, as uh, I was one of the those reporters who were, you know, listening to Powell on on the day he uh, mentioned autopilot and, and markets freaked out and was 
among those who were slow in doing it uh, in, in, in realizing what was going on. We have a bit of a process where when we know a big news event is, is happening with, uh, that involves the Federal Reserve or other news events that we will line up lots of phone calls across our team to ask folks in the market, you know, what do you think? And uh, that's how we realized um, what we had missed, what, what Fred points out that all, so many journalists had missed, uh, that uh, uh, it was pretty clear that um, uh, the market reaction to us spoke a lot to the amount of, of hand-holding that financial markets still expect from the Fed. Um, so what I was going to do was talk a little bit about the evolution of that hand-holding. And, uh, you know, talking about the evolution of Fed communications, um, framing it in that, in that sense, I was going to run through a bit of, like, an example of some very uh, rudimentary analysis that, uh, that, that, that we did at, at, at Reuters, uh, doing some natural language processing. Now, uh, following the illustrious speakers earlier, I, I feel quite humbled in, 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 in a putting up a slide of my caveman analysis of, uh, 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 but um, it gives an example of, of some of the tools that journalists can and, and, and do use to do this, this sort of, um, to try to piece out what, uh, to come up with an objective way to talk about what's going on at the Fed. So, so what's been happening? Um, for uh, some time now, for uh, uh, I think it's really been a couple of years, just about any Fed policymaker you hear talk will talk about how they want to get back to normal. They want to normalize policy is the way you hear about it all the time. And you'll hear this from a range of Fed folks, uh, whether they're a hawk or a dove, and they have a, a bit of a problem. Um, they made some really significant changes to their communication framework uh, during the recession. Uh, how they talk about policy uh, uh, during and after the recession. And it's, I, I think the case that, that Fred was talking about shows how it's, you know, proving hard and, and at least awkward to unwind some of those changes. So under Ben Bernanke, the Fed's chair started holding regular press conferences to explain policy decisions. Uh, we got used to that quickly. Other central banks have, 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 have done that, have been doing that. Uh, and then they also started, as uh, Fred mentioned, uh, giving these uh, uh, what we call the dot plots, uh, or what Wall Street dubbed the, the dot plots, the pretty extraordinarily clear indications about where they see policy going, where they see the economy going. Um, and they also put in very clear, gave, started to give pretty clear uh, indications in, in their policy statements about, about where they saw policy going. And, um, this was generally uh, couched in terms by whether it be academics, journalists, or, or, or folks on Wall Street of uh, uh, forward guidance. Um, and they didn't, as, as folks here, are, are, a lot of folks are, are well aware, they didn't make these changes to advance lofty ideals of transparency necessarily, and not, not completely anyway. They, they had their backs up against the wall during this, this economic crisis. Their, their uh, policy rate was uh, effectively at zero, and they had sort of spent their ammo, their normal tools, and so they they um, started to change their communication tools or adopt some of these new policies as a way to try to get extra um, to ease financial conditions even more. So the the logic of it is 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 uh, I suppose simple enough that if you promise that you're going to keep short-term rates low for a while, that long-term rates will follow, and it helps you get a bit more bang for your buck. So while they're beefing up their language about um, policy, uh, they were making increasingly complex assessments of where the economy was, where it was going to be, and their statements get harder and harder to read. And um, so this first statement is, this first slide is, is something that um, a lot of folks had been doing before then, uh, 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 early in the crisis, noticing, wow, they're starting to talk a lot more. Uh, putting a lot more information in it. If you could go to the next one. Uh, so this is um, this is what uh, uses what's called the um, flesh Kincaid reading grade uh, grade level uh, index. Uh, it basically measures how much a text uh, 
relies on big words and long sentences, so average number of syllables and average number of uh, words per sentence, and uh, it, it gives you a rough idea of uh, how hard it is to, to easily read a text. It was developed in the 70s. Um, I believe originally the original consumer was the military. They wanted to make sure that folks could read training manuals who had a, you know, different educational backgrounds. Um, I, the, the text that I prepared, which I'm not really reading from, but I, I ran it through the index uh, before I uh, came here, and it's, I'm talking at roughly a 10th grade level, you know? <laughs> to, to, to take from that what you will. Um, and during the, uh, during the crisis, as um, even after the recession, as the Fed was, was realizing um, we're in sort of deep doo-doo where the recession is ending, and if the recession is over and we're still stuck, we need to do get more tools together, they started really boosting their forward guidance. And you can see that the required reading level for an FOMC statement goes up to about PhD levels. Um, so uh, I was one of the consumers then. I was you know, as baffled as you might expect. Maybe some of you were too. There, there was a lot to take in in those statements. Um, I wasn't actually reporting on the Fed directly then, but it was um, heady reading. And so um, some economists at the Dallas Fed um, I think they were writing around 2015 or so, had looked at the Flesch-Kincaid indi indices, um, the readings uh, going up through the Bernanke era, and they found that uh, the more uh, hard to read a statement was, even, even more so as, a, I think, a predictive indicator com relative to uh, the uh, word length in the statement, that they were getting more bigger movements, bigger monetary shocks, uh, from those statements, and uh, they, these Dallas Fed economists f figured that it was a function of there being more information. Um, so a couple weeks ago, I wrote a news story looking at uh, readability of Fed communications, in, including statements since the Bernanke era, and uh, the grade level has been coming down, and I think that is tells us a bit about the sort of, um, uh, there being a little less hand-holding uh, the unwinding of that hand-holding, the, uh, the opening statement, and then if you could go to the next one. And this is a Flesh Kincaid index of the opening statements by Fed chairs. Uh, so this only started under Bernanke, the, so you know, we don't have as long of a historical record like the, the, the other index goes all the way back to Greenspan. Um, and you can see that uh, I should have I should have noted where Powell starts, but he's uh, all the way on on, on on the end over here, and uh, Powell has made uh, a, a point about trying to be clear and con uh, concise, especially talking to the general public and and his congressional overseers. Uh, and uh, as a journalist, this is like an extra sort of fun area because we can look at a. a, a person, a character, and, and try to assess that uh, this is the impact of this man uh, who has this, this, this plan. Um, so they've been getting more readable, and by the time we get to the January FOMC statement, there's, you know, they've stripped out so much of the forward guidance, they, uh, all of it essentially, they don't promise anymore whether rates are going to go up or down. Uh, and you know, it's kind of the place you'd expect uh, the, to be if as if as if you're a central banker and you're guiding the point the economy to a point where, you know, it looks pretty stable, you, maybe rates are at a Goldilocks level where they're not stimulating the economy or dragging on it. And now the the tricky part, and and this gets to um, back to what Fred was talking about, um, f where Powell finds himself now is that um, the. The, the, even though the, they've stripped out some of these tools, they can't, or not stripped out the tools, they've backed off on the, some of the forward guidance. Some of these changes in communication policy, they put in there during the dark days after the recession, and they can't just get rid of them. And we're at a point now where they've gotten rid of, of forward guidance, essentially, and they're about to come out with a new dot plot next week. And uh, it's a little awkward that uh, we don't know what if it shows that there's still the median uh, fork uh, FOMC policymaker still sees 
one hike this year, even though they won't suggest in the statement that, it, that that's the case. The other thing is that this tool that they started uh, in, in, in darker days, um, what will happen if uh, in the coming months, one and then maybe two policymakers start to see a rate cut? You know, what kind of effect will that have when, it, when we start to see some sort of eroding confidence uh, from this dramatic, you know, relative like uh, transparency that we now have from the Fed? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Robin, we've we've been hearing from uh, Fred and Jason about changes in the Federal Reserve communication and and changes in the clarity of that communication. But there obviously have been changes on the side of the administration and how they're communicating as well. So, what kind of changes do you do you see there, and how has the media and have the markets reacted to those? Um, yes. No. So it's. It's a new world. I mean, it's not new that politicians and administrations and governments use new forms of communicating uh, to get the message through, but the speed and the frequency is unparalleled, I think, now. I've actually been quite hard. I was quite worried about how it would affect the media industry and, and consumers early on in the administration, but I think now there's been a certain amount of saturation or, you know, we just got tired of the frequency of everything. So people do it a little bit more strategically. Specifically, on the market side, you know, there was a, we had this discussion internally, and I talked to many investors about this. How do you react to Donald Trump savaging Nordstrom for not running Ivanka's clothing line, for example? You know, Nordstrom shares took a dive, you know, what, what do you do? We felt that we shouldn't cover everything that came, comes out of any administration anyway. And we try and pick our battles and focus on the important stuff. Uh, and there was a lot of stuff coming out of the administration. But you know, we can't pretend, as some people wanted to, that Donald Trump didn't matter. He's the president of the United States. What he says matters. Even if he doesn't intend to follow up on action, it matters. And I think that's how markets reacted uh, to start with as well. But we've seen a decreasing impact of the tweets whether it's been on individual companies when he tweeted out about them, to now more recently trade. That's been quite interesting because that's obviously an area where the president has a lot of leeway and a lot of power, and the market obviously reacts to that in certain cases, but it's been interesting to see how little really they react given the influence that the president has. Um, broadly speaking, I think also you know taking you not just the administration, but like people like AOC and... You know, we are in a new world of communication where people are, are circumventing traditional media organizations. That changed the game, broadly speaking, I and mean, we have the 2020 election shaping up. I suspect at some point the markets are going to start freaking out about stuff coming from the Democrats as they tack to the left ahead of the primaries. And as the markets broadly seem to be pricing in that Donald Trump probably won't be president in 2021, that's stuff they have to start taking seriously. Um, and that's something we're still trying to figure out how we deal with. Uh, we tend to be a little bit market reactive. The markets start <coughs> freaking out about something, we tend to write about it to explain, maybe to say they shouldn't worry about it or not. Um, but we'll be a little bit more reactive. I don't think we're going to go too overboard with random tweet bombs coming from the DNC anytime soon. Okay. Okay. Um, so, James, uh, following up on this, you know, we've talked about more straightforward and direct modes of communication, both from the Fed and the administration. Um, should communication be more straightforward? Is there some value in the, in the complexity and nuance that we had before? Or, you know, what are the pros and cons of all of this? Uh, yeah, th uh, first of all, thanks, and uh, thanks to uh, Harry and uh, Melina for hosting a great event. Uh, great to be here. Um, I, uh, I don't know if any anonymous coders are going to characterize my comments here, but I can't guarantee that they won't move equity prices. Um, I, uh, I'm glad, uh, <laughs> glad uh, Jason showed the uh, empirical data because I, I think uh, one uh, thing that's refreshing about the Powell Fed so far is uh, a bias toward plain English, uh, a bias against, uh, forgive me in this crowd, academic jargon. I think that's, a, that's helpful. Obviously, he's uh, um, having uh, challenges like a lot of new Fed chairs have in figuring out how to, how to talk to markets, how to, how to talk to the public. I, I guess we can uh, 
uh, debate and, and there's a case to be made on both sides of whether when we, you talk about that change from uh, autopilot in December to uh, no preset course in January, is that uh, a change in his policy or is that just uh, Powell learning how to speak to markets? Um, so a uh, question there, but, but in general, I do think a, uh, a more humble, more open, uh, um, more, uh, a, a more clear uh, uh, Fed chair is a good thing. He seems to be moving in that direction. And, and uh, as you point out, it's in a challenging environment with a president. Uh, you mentioned the tweets. Uh, there were two uh, right before that uh, December rate hike decision in the two days beforehand. Uh, one uh, from the president, it is incredible that with a very strong dollar and virtually no inflation, the outside world blowing up around us, Paris is burning and China way down, the Fed is even considering yet another interest rate hike. Take the victory. <laughs> so that was uh, December 17th, and then uh, I, uh, I guess I have to note, December 18th, he said, I hope the people over at the Fed will read today's Wall Street Journal editorial before they make yet another mistake. Also, <laughs> don't, don't let the market become any more liquid than it already is. Stop with the 50 Bs. Feel the market. <laughs> don't just go by meaningless numbers. Good luck. So uh, the, uh, it's, a, it's a tough environment for a Fed chair. He's uh, obviously accountable to uh, all of us, to the political system, but uh, needs to... Uh, show he's uh, independent, and that may have had something to do with the day after that last tweet, uh, the Fed uh, raising rates for the fourth time last year. So um, he's got a difficult task. He went on 60 Minutes this week, and he did not shoot back at the president. He simply stated the, the fact that uh, he cannot be fired unless it's uh, for cause. Now, let's hope there's not a, a moment where we test what the uh, law really means uh, and what, what for cause is. But um, in general, I do think it's uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of positive things coming out of the way uh, the Powell Fed communicates. He uh, was uh, speaking at Stanford last week, and, or last week, I should say, and uh, he was encouraging a public dialogue on the Fed and its tools. And he was asking about uh, the recent history of QE and forward guidance and saying, how well did they work? I think this is an area that there ought to be a public uh, uh, discussion and, and uh, debate about. You, you compare that to uh, one of his predecessors, Ben Bernanke, who has basically been on a, a tour to sell people on the idea that, that he did the right thing, that it had to be done. And I know, obviously, there's a, there's a lot of argument for that. But I, I think there's a, the, uh, maybe a misperception there that it was really a lack of a sales job. I think Persuading most people that we need bank bailouts is a sale that can never be made in the in the court of public opinion. But uh, but the point is that uh, unlike uh, Mr. Bernanke or his immediate predecessor uh, Janet Yellen, what you're getting from Powell is an invitation to talk about how the Fed could do better, instead of in Bernanke's case, kind of a sales job about how great it is or. In the case of Janet Yellen, she tended to veer into issues beyond the job of the Fed chair. Uh, income inequality, people have different thoughts about it, different views, not directly related to the job of the Fed chair. And I think that uh, if you're talking about maintaining independence, credibility, um, this is probably a welcome change where you see in the, the 60 Minutes interview, you see in his recent speeches, um, Powell, I think, much more uh, concerned about sticking to the topics related to the Fed's job, uh, price stability, full employment. So um, I think, uh, as I said, uh, uh, early days and, and still a learning period, but I think uh, a lot to be encouraged about in terms of a, an open and a uh, direct and a, uh, a humble Fed. Jason, I wanted to come back to your, your discussion of um, natural la or language processing and mm -hmm. analytics on mm -hmm. speeches. So if this becomes more commonplace, not just for reporters, but also for markets to be analyzing news algorithmically, mm -hmm. one might think that the people making the statements would anticipate this and maybe you know, run a, a text through <coughs> uh, as you did with your text to see its you know, complexity and what kinds of meanings that algorithms might extract from that. Um, do you see that coming? And if so, how might that change the communications themselves? 
Uh, it's a good question. I'd, I'd like to ask Jay, Jay Powell that, um, whether, you know, what kind of uh, procedures he might have, if, if they're explicit or not, for, you know, keeping a good, simple message. I mean, when you look at, like, he, he made a point early in his tenure, um, well, not, uh, well, no, it was a couple co press conferences in, uh, I think it was in the June presser, where he said, I'm going to say this in clear, clean, en you know, plain English. And um, we, we know from the transcripts that past Fed chairs had, had that in mind, they, that Bernanke talked about it, like when they were just getting started, that they wanted to have this, you know, easy to digest message that would help them, you know, try to give a little more oomph to their statement and get the, the desired result. Um, as far as running it through software, I mean, there is some precedent for that. I think that there are um, companies, regulators maybe, who, what was I reading about? Uh, auto insurance policies needed to be at a certain level of understanding. Uh, I, I mean, I think the other thing with natural language processing for the central bank is that they're going to be, um, that y we know that there's an interest at central banks in natural language processing. When I was started researching the story and I was just Googling around, I found like a guidebook from the Bank of England on how to do uh, natural language processing and what, 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 what are some papers to read and techniques and software and things like that. They're thinking about it. There are, uh, there's been fed board papers where they sort of look at academic work that is doing um, some, you know, look, doing scoring on their statements to try to get better meeting and figure out, like, what are, you know, people backing out economic forecasts from the minutes and the such. So it's, uh, it's definitely an area of, uh, where I'm sure we'll see a lot more from, from the central banks. Yeah. Um, Fred, one of the things that I know you've, you've been thinking about is, uh, is, you know, fake news and robo news, and you've written a bit about that. I mean, that's a whole other aspect of, of how technology is, is changing media and communications and, and potentially market reactions. How do you see that impacting your job as a reporter or a manager of reporters? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a conundrum for us that we're wrestling with all the time. I mean, um, we're seeing so much more communications, uh, you know, from, from the Fed. Uh, we're seeing speeches. We're seeing interviews. Uh, we're seeing conversations. We're seeing testimony to Congress. Um, you know, all, all of these things, uh, you know, factor into our view of what the Fed is going to do and, and what it means for the, I mean, I'm more focused on the economy than I am on the market. So we're, you know, my reporters are constantly looking for what is Powell saying about the economic outlook, you know, and, and what impact is it going to have on, you know, on, on the way people in, and, and companies are operating in our, in our, uh, in our economy. Uh, is a recession on the horizon and so forth. Um, but yeah, I mean, it does, it does make things challenging. Everything moves faster now, uh, you know, and it's, by the way, it's not just the Fed chairman. It's, of course, you know, the other members of the, of the FOMC uh, seem to be speaking more frequently, more publicly, uh, more widely. Uh, most, you know, they, they tend to speak with a relatively single voice uh, on the issues that the Fed deals with directly. Um, but even so, they have their own, their own views. And, um, I just think it adds, you know, extra layers of complexity to the, 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 the process of, you know, divining what is the Fed going to do and what does its view say about the economy. Yeah. Uh, so, Robin, when, one thing that um, you had mentioned when, when we spoke earlier is the, what the future of the media is likely to be. So you pointed out that one of the things that gives um, journalists an important role is that they get uh, data ahead of time. And that there's this this question of this uh, this process of embargo, and so you get this time to write a story, and then all release it, uh, a thoughtful, logical story, all at the same time, and that creates some some demand for for your articles because because they're not happening after the fact. But is this likely to continue? And you know where um, d if if the media doesn't have this protected role, will it still, will it still be adding value? You know, do you think technology might be disintermediating the, the whole media sector in the future? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, journalists love embargoes because it makes our jobs easier. I mean, it's simple as that. You know, everybody's fundamentally a little bit lazy, whether they admit it or not. Uh, but I think embargoes are, you know, a terrible thing. I think they just, don't work. I think people write to a rote, they write to a formula. 
uh, they stick very much to the close narrative. I think without ro embargoes, especially when it comes to big economic data, people might just simply write the news to fit the market reaction. In economics and financial journalism, there is always a temptation to look at how a share price or a bond yield or the dollar reacted and assume that is the right interpretation. Very often it is, let's face it, that is the consensus wisdom of millions of very smart people. But millions of smart people do dumb things all the time. They get it wrong, and I think journalists need to be braver around that. And I think that's where the value add can be when you do see something that in your experience, in your expertise, in talking <coughs> to people, you think maybe the market got something wrong. Broadly speaking, I do think that uh, the thing with natural language processing isn't just the, you know, the sentiment analysis that we can do, it's how to what extent journalism can be automated. And we're already seeing this in the news wise. I remember when I was at Bloomberg many years ago, they started kicking the ties. Reuters was ahead of the game at that point. But, you know, it's not necessarily, I think this is a great thing. Like if we automate, I think half the stuff, maybe not half the stuff the FT does. <laughs> Just everybody else. Promise. <laughs> but a lot of the stuff in journal, and let's face it, is formulaic bullshit. It's, it can easily be done by an algo today, and in 10 years' time, certainly can and will be done. Whether it's you know, sports results for local teams or earnings reports, and you add a bit of like human knowledge. You know, get, the algo probably won't write Apple's earnings, but it might write the first five or six paragraphs, and you add a bit of, sort of human magic on top of it, man plus machine, human plus machine, sorry. Um, I think that's great for people like me, because I don't like doing the boring stuff the stuff that has no value add. And I think that's probably good for a lot of readers as well. I do worry about the knock-on effect, and I haven't quite decided where I stand on this, in that those are the kind of stories I did when I started out. Those are the kind of stories we all did when we started out. The kind of boring, non-value added stuff where we couldn't screw things up too badly if we did made a mistake, essentially. And I think that will have a knock-on impact on the overall sort of knowledge and experience of journalists in the future. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I, th I think that's actually a thing that, you know, a lot of the entry-level jobs in journalism are not going to be around in 10 years' time. Okay. Certainly in the financial newswire type of journalism. Well, just to add, I, I think uh, software probably will be able to replace me very soon, but in the meantime, anyone who wants to email me non-public information, please do. <laughs> I mean, we've been talking about a lot of different kinds of changes that are that are happening. Um, you know, some of them seem more systemic, and some of them have to do with with per particular personalities that that are you know in place in in offices and positions right now. How much of this change, James, do you do you see as as sort of a one off, a uh, short term change, and how much do you see as as persistent going you know going forward far into the future? Yeah, I think. Uh uh, Trump is uh, he's a, he's a one-off in terms of communicating this way and having this interaction with the the Fed. I think um, uh, I think he may uh, be uh, encouraging more uh, openness generally. But um, um, in in some ways, this isn't uh, that new. If you recall, uh, uh, George uh, H. W. Bush kind of uh, more maybe more politely uh, griped about. Uh, the Fed uh, and thought it uh, cost him re-election. Um, interestingly, uh, as we've seen the reporting since, the during the Clinton administration, Bill Clinton wanted to complain about the Fed, but he was persuaded, I believe by Robert Rubin and others, that it was a dumb idea because you would probably just look like you were, or sound like you were griping. The Fed probably wouldn't uh, bend to your will in any case, so it would uh, make you look not only uh, uh, political and self-interested, but uh, but weak because the uh, the response would not be the one uh, you've gotten. So um, so in terms of uh, how we uh, how we have this interaction with the with the Fed and the uh, the White House uh, communicating with each other, it's not entirely new. But in terms of the uh, the unvarnished uh, uh, commentary, uh, as we've seen in in lots of other uh, um, issues with the White House, that is that is new. I would just add that, you know, with Jay Powell, I think we all need to remind ourselves that we're dealing with a Fed chairman who has a rather different background from his predecessors. I mean, this is not a man with a PhD uh, degree in economics. This is a man who has not been in academia. This is not a man who's spent his life doing, you know, academic scholarly research. 
he made a personal fortune in the investment world. And he did serve in government in the Treasury Department before he came on to the <clears throat> Federal Reserve. Um, but he is somebody who I think is keenly aware of uh, how the financial markets, uh, or, the, or the, certainly the, the, the importance of the financial markets as a fundamental underpinning of the economy, uh, maybe to a larger extent than, than his predecessors who dealt so much more with you know, the, the, the economy. And of course, Bernanke was a scholar of, of, of the Great Depression, and Yellen had also done you know, work in that, in that area. And that's one of the reasons why I think we're seeing more plain spokenness, more concise communications from this uh, Fed chairman, which can be bad and good, uh, <laughs> depending on what he says and what your perspective is. But um, in some ways, it makes the job easier because his language is simpler. Uh, he's uh, he's been in he's been out in the investment world for much of his career, and he knows how how that operates to a greater extent than his predecessors. Um, but it's just a different way. You know, he just has a different outlook from you know the, the three or four Fed chairmen who uh, pre preceded him. And I I'd, I'd add that uh, there's also Jay Powell's political savvy to to take into account here. Uh, this is a guy who's been in and out of government has uh, has a an, an understanding of, of you know the, that the Fed does answer to Congress talks about that a lot. Of course, Yellen and Bernanke did as well. But uh, Powell, you do uh, see him on the Hill more. He's uh, he's working the halls, as it were, having meetings with 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 lawmakers. Um, perhaps I mean we we might speculate as a as a way to to check what we're hearing from the White House. Um, and uh, his plain spokenness is probably partly directed at Congress too, not just to the general public and to Wall Street, but he wants to make sure that he's not, you know, uh, you know, as Fred mentioned, he's not a PhD economist, so he's not going to be, you know, talking about R star and 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 things like that necessarily. But he wants to put things plainly so that his overseers understand him. And moving to a press conference after every FOMC meeting, um, having speeches that are pretty plain English, um, he himself uh, said a couple of well, a couple of weeks ago he had this uh, a little more more than that, but uh, had a, a town hall with teachers and they asked him, "How do you, you know, pick your words for your statements?" And he was very specific that our FOMC statement is very technical and geared toward communicating to Wall Street and there are certain words that we know that um, you know that the uh, uh, that Wall Street is going to know the difference between say inflation expectations and inflation compensation and, and and technical things like that and then there are the other statements speeches um, I, I think is press conference statements part of that where it's it's more towards a, a, a general understanding and including those congressional overseers okay Robin yeah I mean maybe just to do on my point of like journalists being having to go against the grain I'm I kind of agree vehemently uh, with the mark about Jay Powell screwing things up mm -hmm. frankly I think the idea that Fed chairs can speak plainly is idiotic. <laughs> Frankly, like Main Street does not tune in to Fed chair press conferences. They just don't. Right. And I think you know, this is partly the market's own fault that investors are panicky, flighty, overly reactive people, but that's just the reality. I think Jay has slowly come to realize that there's the ideal of speaking plainly and being transparent yeah. and the reality of the actual practical impact that has. Yeah. I'm not saying the marks are right in this. I mean, for example, on the balance sheet issue, the autopilot um, issue, I'm, I, I was on holiday in Norway for Christmas, but because I'm a really cool guy, I sent the kids out and sat down with some popcorn to watch the press conference. Um, <laughs> And I knew the markets were going to freak out about the Biden show because the markets had been talking about it for a few months, actually, by that point. Mm -hmm. They were very sensitive to this. Jay only reiterated the Fed's policy, and the markets vomited. And I haven't disagreed with the markets, but I could have told him that that was going to happen. <laughs> I think this is one thing, for example, the journal 
actually has had a good history of getting Fed uh, correspondents who used to be Marcus correspondents. Hilsenrath, I think, is a former Marcus correspondent. I think that actually helps your understanding of how Marcus react. And, you know, the Fed, lots of people like to say they talk plainly to everyday people. You know, people need to understand what we do. And that's true in the abstract, but reality, look. I mean, how many here have really tuned in to watch a Fed press conference? Here, hands up. And this is a pretty select group. <laughs> if we did a Vox Pop, if you found one in a thousand, I'd be really impressed. And that 1,000th person probably works on Wall Street. So I just think we just need to react, re accept the realities around this. And, you know, I think the Fed has belatedly. I actually think that we're going to see a little bit more fuscatory language come from Jay Powell, uh, from the Fed. And the markets are kind of okay with that. They'll say they're not, but you know, constructive ambiguities, something that you know, Greenspan pioneered, and I don't think he was maybe the genius that people said, but you know, sometimes being a bit ambiguous actually helps. So this has been fantastic. I want to leave a little bit of time for, for audience questions because I think we've covered a lot of ground and I'm guessing there's some reactions to this. So at this point, uh, let's open this up. And I've got a really good story about LBJ and Fed chairs, oh, though. Yeah. Oh. You, have you <laughs> heard this one? We talked about it last night. <laughs> no, 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 him oh. dropping his trousers. Oh. I heard this from Henry Kaufman, uh, who used to be the Solomon chief economist back in the day when there was literally four people covering the Fed. But he, Arthur Burns, I think, told him that one pay LBJ brought Burns into the White House and said, look, you bastard. I'm going to have surgery on this tomorrow, and dropped his trousers and showed a mole on his butt or something like that. <laughs> You're not going to raise rates whilst I'm under the needle, are you? <laughs> and Arthur Burns said no. Well, so that's direct all, communication. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so apparently it's in one of the books. I don't know if it was a mole or not, but uh, LBJ dropping his pants is apparently stone cold truth. So. Very good. But that uh, was private. It wasn't on Twitter, at least. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Uh, okay, so what uh, do we have questions from the audience? Sure. I, the one of the questions I have, I attended, I believe, the first or second one of these conferences. And what was interesting to me when they had this panel, the panel actually beat themselves up for not being more critical of the Fed before the financial crisis. And at the time, I thought, you know, I thought the journalists did a good job of talking about subprime problem for years. It was the Fed ignored it, it was, at least my opinion. I'm curious now that it's been 10 years, we're still at only two and a quarter percent rates. Uh, I think if we go back, remember Bernanke said it was only going to be a temporary uh, zero rate that went on for seven years. Mm -hmm. We're only at two and a quarter percent now, 10 years later. Mm -hmm. Should maybe the journalists be a little bit more critical of the Federal Reserve and their policies and be a little bit more questioning? I guess that's a question. I mean, I know James sort of alluded to a little bit that maybe you're a little bit dubious of Bernanke, but I'm curious if you feel it should be a little bit more critical, and if you're not, if there's a reason why. Do, do you mean the 2008 Fed or the current Fed? I mean, well, the Fed in general. I mean, I think, obviously, like, Powell's only been there for a year, year and a half. But just in general, I mean, no one seems to question. Uh, maybe I should address this more of Bernanke, what the view of the panel is on Bernanke. I guess it's more my criticism, but uh, in this day and age still. Well, can I? I I've been writing tons of mean things about the Fed for ages, and frankly, I've been wrong. The Fed has played a blinder, is my opinion. Frankly, when you think about, you know, the stuff that we went through in 07, 08, and I do think they were asleep at the wheel, or were not, they were blind to the fact that how the financial economy affects the real economy. Uh, and it's understandable because you know, the economy is an incredibly complex system, and it's hard to understand the entire thing. It just doesn't work that way. You can be an electrician, you can't necessarily fix a, a, a TV because it's a different thing. Um, but I think that I'm just going to be contrarying. Everybody loves beating up on the Fed, but really, if you told me 10 years ago would be where we are today with a steady, underwhelming, but steady stretch of growth that's been one of the longest in history, markets have been buoyant, everything's fine, inflation's under control, and unemployment at you know, near record lows, I think it was a holy crap. That would have been just an incredible period. The Fed must have done an incredible job. And the fact is, look, they've made mistakes. I think the taper tantrum, they screwed up pretty badly. I think some of the messaging around last year was bad, but they did a great job, frankly, is my opinion. And I, every time, time I've written something about them screwing up, I might have been right in isolation, but on the macro level, I've been wrong to be quite so critical. That doesn't mean that I should now suddenly say, oh, well, the Fed can't do any wrong, because clearly they can. But I think it's people are too quick to beat up the Fed post-crisis. <clears throat> because we're scarred by those experiences. 
I would just add um, that it's it's easy to forget back way back in 2000, as, as far back as 2010 and 2011, there was enormous pressure on the Fed and criticism on the, of the Fed from hawkish economists, market, market people, uh, even some members of the FOMC itself, that inflation was about to burst out of control and the Fed needed to start raising rates soon. And this was 2011, 2012. The Fed held off until December 2015, and then it did it only once. And then it did it once more in 2016, and inflation never took off. In fact, it remained below the Fed's target until very recently, and even now it's, it's barely where it needs to be uh, under the Fed's guidelines. So I, I think that you know, there's something to be said for the resilience of the Fed in withstanding the enormous pressure that it was under to raise rates much, much earlier in the economic recovery than it did. And I'd just add that there certainly have been a lot of stories by journalists uh, aping some of these fears about that you know, inflation might be about poised to, to burst out. And we'll find an academic who's, who has that, who's done some crunch, some math, and, and shows that, yeah, the Phillips curve, it's real. Like, here's the math for it. And we'll write a story about that, that it's there. It's, um, I'm, I'm not sure it's critical of the Fed's institution, but we write those kinds of stories, I think, sometimes because it's, it's interesting to think that the people at the wheel could be really wrong, and we want to highlight those risks. Um, I think it's still possible they were really wrong. Um, and this may seem like a long time ago, but I would say we haven't seen the end of the story. Uh, the, uh, we were talking about the news where the, uh, the massive balance sheet still $4 trillion. Now they're, they're not going to bring it back to where it was before the crisis. And I guess we're all going to find out what that means. Obviously, those years of uh, zero interest rate policy were not cost free for savers. Uh, they had a lot to do with the income inequality that, uh, that uh, Janet Yellen liked to talk about. Um, obviously, those were uh, very good years for people with uh, uh, financial assets and not so good for lots of other people. Um, just in terms of the pre-crisis, I'm not taking the credit. This is before I worked at the Journal. Uh, there were a lot of editorials about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, uh, criticism of the negative real interest rates that the Fed pursued uh, in the early years of the 2000s, which I think most people would say had a lot to do with, with what uh, came later. So um, this is one of the reasons I don't think the Fed should be uh, immune from criticism. I, I don't think we've seen the end of this story, but uh, um, uh, you talk about uh, the negative real interest rates in the early 2000s, you can go back through its history uh, I'll give a plug here. I uh, co-authored a book last year called Borrowed Time. It's a history of Citigroup, but it also talks about the, uh, the Fed. Um, there are uh, actually still two copies in the campus bookstore here for anyone who wants to rush out after the event. <laughs> but, uh, but the point is that uh, you know, no, uh, no Donald Trump tweeting, no, uh, as far as I know, maybe some of the financial historians will, will speak to this, wasn't, wasn't an an insane amount of political pressure in the 1920s and 1930s to be so tight. They just made mistakes. And even after the crash, they were tightening in the early 1930s. I think that's one of the reasons for the Bernanke policy is that he had studied that history and he did not want to make that mistake again. And did he go too far the other way? I, I don't think we know the answer yet. So um, there's a couple of things happening. So after Facebook um, basically killed local classifieds, and now we're talking about algos replacing uh, the fraction of reporters that's left. So we might see a further concentration of news coverage on the liberal coasts, whether it's London or New York. And how will news organizations try to remain relevant given global rise of populism and still hear mainstream and uh, working class concerns? Not a lot, of, a lot of eagerness to field that one. <laughs> no, I mean, I've got tons of opinions. Just wait. Um, look, I mean, the death of local journalism is incredibly sad. Uh, I mean, it predates Facebook. It was mostly Craigslist here in the U.S. and online classifiers elsewhere. Uh, it's it's something I worry about on the local state corruption level. I mean, we see this in Europe and the U.S. as well. It's it's bad. 
I actually think there will be a yeah, consolidation around trusted brands. Now, that might seem self-serving because hopefully I work for one. Um, and I don't necessarily think that's terrible. I don't worry too much about like how we look. I mean, the FT, like we're not being for sort of middle of America. So for, you know, we just aren't. We're kind of, the FT sometimes pretends we're not, but like we are a business paper. Um, I do think business issues and economics is something that should be more widely understood, however. And that's why we, and I know the journal as well, has done uh, a lot of good work in reaching out to universities and schools. So, for example, in all of Europe, I think now, if you're a high school, you can get a free FT subscriptions there. Uh, and I think the journal's got something similar here, here in America, right? right? Um, on working class issue, I, I don't know. I, I feel, look, a lot of it's just rhetoric and hot words and buzzwords and populism. But populism isn't new. I mean, this has been around for ages. It feels more current now because we feel directly threatened by it, and it's unusual. But, you know, I, don't know, I, I remember, like, Seattle going up in flames almost. You know, it's, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I struggle to take, like, feel this is a serious threat. I do think on the local journalism side there is stuff, and I know here in Colombia there's actually various projects going on looking at this. Um, I don't think the FT, the journal, or Reuters are going to be. Well, maybe Reuters will be the part of the solution and the AP as well. But yeah, sorry, that was a bit meandering. Part of the solution for the, the local news local deficit? News, yeah. Well, we won't have somebody in like Sacramento or like, yeah, I, I mean, even in Europe. We yeah, I mean, I think one, one of the things the AP is proudest of is we still do have a correspondent in every state capital in the country, which very, very sadly is. Sadly, is um, uh, we're, sadly we're we're often the only one, and maybe there's one or two. But you know, as Robin is pointing out, you know, Metro dailies around the country are under such enormous pressure that they have cut back severely on their local and state coverage, which is it's really terrible because you know these are places where corruption goes on chronically, and when it's not covered, it it doesn't get uncovered, and so. Um, I don't. I don't know that there's an answer to that. You know, thank. I mean, I feel good that the AP is at least covering those areas. Um, but the other point I would say, also echoing Robin, is I, I do think that there that there is going to be a consolidation around, as you say, trusted brands. And I think we all work for what I would consider trusted brands. And I think as people consume news in the years ahead, I think the 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 fact that there are still going to be, you know fundamentally a handful or maybe more than a handful but of trusted news organizations that are regarded as providing unbiased fair comprehensive news <clears throat> I think it's going to add to our our role it's going to add primacy in, to our role and in, in, because there's going to be fewer of us we'll be stronger hopefully because of it but 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 I just think you know because of the changes and social media changes and what we're seeing you know from the president and so forth I think there is among a, among a strong you know group of people uh, in, in this country and around the world, a need for unbiased, uh, uh, comprehensive coverage that people feel they can trust that is down the middle and is not you know not not going one way or the other. I'd I'd add that uh, this consolidation of the media market, which is you know a function of the sort of democratization of of media that we get from the internet, uh, as as Robin pointed out, we. we the, the pattern is toward a few trusted brands. And what's scary to me about that is that if we only end up uh, with uh, you know, a, a, a precious few of those brands, that's not, I wonder what it means for the institution of journalism and what it means for uh, uh, the, the, the corpus of, 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 of journalists out there. There's not gonna be as many jobs. And so the normal uh, progression, career progression for a journalist is often uh, starting at a smaller paper. Maybe they go to uh, grad school and get connections and get an internship at a big place. And, and you have this rise of cream to the top. But if you um, only have five big organizations, then you're probably going to lose a whole, you're not going to have the same sort of evolution of talent. And that, that's, that's worrisome. Uh, I, I think there are a couple of questions there. So one is a business model question, and the other is a question of uh, uh, professional uh, uh, standards. So on the on the business model side, I maybe there are some investors in the room who have who have uh, pursued this space. I I've seen ventures where the idea was you have 
uh, online uh, coverage of of selected local markets, and then you can you have a network and you can sell national advertising. That seemed like a plausible way to go for local news, but I don't think any of those have really really crushed it. So I'm not sure why why that's not working. I, I think the larger sort of the professional problem that uh, afflicts just about all of the media is that uh, trust uh, among the public is very low in what we do. And I think the um, 2016 was kind of a, a, a stark example of the um, how uh, uh, we were often out of touch with what the um, average American voter was thinking. I, um, I think, like many people, I was very certain for a long time that Donald Trump was not going to be the Republican nominee. I think I said that in a number of uh, uh, public uh, venues. And, uh, you know, uh, obviously that was, that was way off. And I, I think now, uh, you know, I'm not sure that uh, uh, you could say it's really improved in terms of... Um, what uh, we have thought of traditionally as sort of uh, mainstream news organizations uh, in their reporting, not just their opinion commentary, have now uh, basically set themselves up as opponents of the president. Um, and, you know, is that why, is that feeding into this continuing distrust? You look at the uh, Emerson College poll that came out this week, it was uh, mainly concerned about uh, uh, assessing the Democratic candidates, um, I believe it was in Michigan, but it was also um, included polling on what people think of the news media, and the the results were not good. We are we are generally, as an industry, generally not uh, not trusted very much. So I think that's a uh, professional challenge uh, uh, for all of us. And if there's only a few of us of those institutions left, they might be even more perceived as being. Elites. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know if it gets down to. I mean, it's certainly you'd like to believe that if there's a the uh, survival of the fittest or uh, like Highlander, there can be only one, and it gets down to one winner that you're the one. But uh, but yeah, maybe maybe people don't like that one either. I don't know. No, but I do think. I mean, just on the diversity point. I mean, look at this panel. I mean. Oh. This basically, you know, apart from you know, the moderator, it's one. Joke. But I disagree with you on lots of things. Yes, no, well, that's very true. <laughs> I'm just saying that when it comes to the media, when I do, I, I think the media beats itself quite a lot, and it should. Uh, I think there's a bit like with Congress. Like Congress has a terrible approval rating. If you ask people to rate their own Congressperson, it gets far better. I think with journalism, it's the same. It's such a I mean, like, what do you mean by journalism? What is journalism? Like, if you ask somebody in New York, they might say, well, Breitbart's terrible. So, yeah, journalism is terrible. It's just, but if you ask people about individual brands, the Journal, AP, Reuters, the FT, the New York Times, all score highly. Um, it's not Fox. I mean, it's just, it's very partisan now, and that's a, a separate issue. I do think on the diversity side, yes, I think here in the US during the election and in Europe around other events, it's shown the media world to be fairly homogenous, fairly middle class, and fairly blind to certain issues. I don't actually think this is new. For example, there's a reason why I was kind of prevaricating on how to say this diplomatically, but working class people getting screwed is not new. That's been going on for a long time. And, you know, the pendulum swings. Uh, right now we're talking about it, but that's good. But I do think the media world needs to, need to do more on diversity. Um, and that's across... Uh, organizations and countries. That's a good place to end things. Uh, thank you very much for a fascinating discussion.